Cables. I'm Ron with Ideal and again welcome to my shop and my channel. Hey in this segment I'm going to cover the topic of cable TV splitters and hopefully demystify these things somewhat for you because for such a simple thing uh, there it can be very confusing as to which ones you ought to buy and which ones you, you shouldn't buy so uh, hang on for the next happy half hour we're going to have a little conversation about cable TV splitters. Now one of the first things I've noticed that when people buy these things, one of the ways we buy them is by looking at the colors of the product. And generally you'll find them, they'll be kind of a silver color or maybe more of a gold color. That's the two basic color choices we have. And of course if we're going to base our choice on color, which may not be the brightest idea in the world, um, uh, if you guess which one that sold the other, if you guessed it was the gold one, you'd be absolutely correct. And you know, sometimes these things will say something about being gold plated, and uh, and I don't care how fancy the packaging looks like or how fancy the splitter looks like, it is not gold plated because if this thing was entirely gold plated, uh, it'd be worth a lot of money. Now, the only time there's any plating in here that might actually mean something to you is where the center conductor goes in that little opening in each of the ports. There's kind of a cam action thing that accepts the center conductor as it goes in there, and uh, if anything's got some plating on it that means something to us, it might be that thing, but uh, as a general rule, no, these are not gold plated. Uh, and also when I look in and in, 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 in go out and buy these things, especially in a, like a retail environment, you know, the marketing folks like to give the customer that choice, that, that good, the better, the best product that they could uh, choose from when they make a, a decision about which one they want. Now, as a general rule, I'm going to tell you the good ones are actually no good. Uh, these cause more problems than anything else. So I'm going to tell you, you know, 40, 50 years ago, fine, but today, not so good. And we'll get into why in a minute. The ones in the middle usually are the ones we want to use. They're more of a high, what we call high performance. We might refer to it as a one gigahertz frequency splitter, uh, and those generally are the ones that we want for cable and satellite app or cable TV applications. I should say cable. Now the ones above that are the best. Usually go at a higher frequency range up to, and um, they may not really help us much with the cable industry signals, but they don't really hurt us none. And if we are looking for a splitter that covers the frequency range of RG6 coax, well then there you go. So that's kind of what we see. So we're going to get into each of these, and I'll start with the low-end ones, and the ones I'm going to ask you to probably try and stay away from. When you peel the backs off these low-end ones, you'll notice there's not a whole lot inside of them, but a couple of what we call ferrite little cores that actually do the splitting of the signal itself. That's the low-end type splitters. Now when I go to the, the, the mid-range, the 1 gigahertz frequency splitters and up, they will have uh, printed circuit board technology inside of them actually doing the splitting of the signals for us. So these more high performance ones are the ones you really ought to look at and you can see there's significant difference on the inside. Now the other reasons we don't like these old ones, and you got to understand these were developed probably back in the 50s uh, when cable and, and over the air broadcast kind of got its start. And uh, these are designed really for analog only type applications or systems and you'll find today that obviously your cable world is a mix of analog and digital so we really need the splitter to do both and these don't work so well. And also they're not bi-directional and that means that signals cannot pass both ways through them and today all the cable systems, your cable modems, set-top boxes have to have that communications back to the cable company. You know what? 40 years ago there was no set-top box or pay-per-view or anything like that, so we didn't need it. So these old splitters really have gotten out of date. And you know, if you take this thing home and you hook up your, say, your cable modem to it, and all of a sudden your high-speed internet stops working, you know, don't be calling up your cable company and tell them to get out there because your, you know, cable system's messed up. It actually is you that's caused this problem. So uh, these, as I said before, cause more problems than anything else. Now. When I, another thing when I look at the splitter, and I can tell you by looking at the splitter, you just really cannot tell if it's any good or not from the outside. But one hint is you want to look at the frequency range on the splitter. And this is the size of the pipeline. And you look at RG6, and RG6 is actually a, a very large pipe. Um, and many, many years ago, we used a very small amount of the pipe. You know, 30 years ago, we were only putting you know, 30 or 40 channels maybe down this pipeline. And today we're stuffing literally hundreds of channels down the pipeline. So it's, it's, we're using a much more of the pipe. So uh, when you look at this frequency range of these splitters, the low end is uh, 5 megahertz. And again, 5 megahertz, okay, which is the low end frequency. 
Now it goes out to uh, how big the pipe out is. How is, is it goes out to a higher frequency, and you know, 30 years ago this might have been a couple hundred megahertz in frequency. Uh, you know, in the last you know 20 grew out to in the you know 500 megahertz and above. It all depends on the number of channels they have in the system, and obviously uh, the size of the pipe it, you know, how it tells us how many channels we get inside the pipe, and the upper end frequency range of the cable system today. Ought to go all the way out to a thousand megahertz. Now, a fancy way of saying one thousand megahertz is to say one gigahertz. Okay, so the frequency range of the cable system ought to go between five and one gigahertz. Now, <clears throat> as I said before, it didn't do that all the way back in the day. So these might have, old splitters might say five to five hundred, five to six hundred. You wanted to say. 1,000 or 1 gig. That's one indication it's a better quality splitter. And it has, again, this printed circuit board technology to it and is bi-directional. Now, when you look at these frequencies inside the home, that's what your cable company is utilizing. You know what? Over-the-air broadcast companies are in this frequency range someplace. Uh, AM and FM radio is in this frequency range. So there's a lot of things that use these frequencies, just not the cable company. But RG6, if you looked at a piece of cabling, every two foot on the cabling, there's a printing on it, and one of the things you'll see is it'll generally say it's swept out or tested to a certain frequency, usually upwards of two to three gigahertz in frequency. And the reason for that is that when we, what other systems use RG6 at home, and that's your satellite company. Now the satellites companies are working at a little different frequency within the homes. Satellites operate you know over the air coming into your home uh, at a very high frequency out of the sky now there's always this little thing that points into the satellite dish and there's coax going from it on into the home inside the home the frequency range is in the neighborhood of 950 megahertz and can go all the way out to 2.15 gigahertz so this is the frequency range of your satellite systems within your home, which is generally a little over what cable TV systems operate, and that's why this table says it's tested out to 2 or 3 gig and we can use it for any application. Now, if you are going to split a higher frequency signal, like a satellite signal, you would need these splitters that are rated at these higher frequencies. And um, as a general rule, though, over the years, we have told you don't ever use splitters on satellites. Now, um, we would utilize something called a multi-switch, which is a different kind of product all, altogether. But you'll find in the last couple of years, there's a, a satellite system out there that is actually beginning to use splitters in their setup. So um, I would refer you back to your satellite company as to whether or not you can split that. So, uh, but if you are, you might want to use these higher frequency splitters. Now, they don't hurt the cable TV system at all. It's just that they're ready for a little higher frequency. Okay, So that's kind of the frequency range that we see uh, being utilized within the home. Now, this uh, only time I can really recommend maybe splitting a satellite signal if you'd like to attempt it with a, a traditional splitter is after the satellite receiver uh, comes in the home. You know, I could, the signal comes in out through the receiver, I could come off the dish and route that cable in a home and hit a satellite receiver box and take the output of that satellite receiver and hit a splitter of some sort, you know, a three-way or four-way splitter, and then feed TVs with that satellite signal. Now what's interesting about this is that this five to one gigahertz range, the TV has a tuner and it is designed to see a certain amount of signal strength and, and, and guess what, we, uh, we want to have a splitter that handles that range. It's somewhere under this one gigahertz in frequency. So the satellite receiver, which is operating at that 950 and above, has to drop the, the signal back down to what a typical TV could see, which is back to, again, under 1 gigahertz in frequency. So you could use a 1 gigahertz splitter here. You wouldn't necessarily need it to. Uh, so as I said before, in many applications, these 1 gig splitters are really all you need. Okay. Now, it's interesting, I think, when we look at how cable companies do what they do today, they, they work within this frequency range. And that range, again, is from 5 uh, megahertz and goes all the way out to, again, to an upper end of 1,000 megahertz 
which again is one gigahertz in frequency. Okay, and the way they split this this whole signal range apart, and you know how this is very similar to a radio. Your set your cable company system works very simply uh, similar to a radio. You know how you turn the knob on a radio and you want to go to the next radio station, and you, so you tune into you know 92.5, say, and you hear a certain radio station, and of course if I go to 99 point whatever, I hear something else. So what are you actually doing when you're turning the knob? You're turning the, the, the radio into a different, that's right, frequency, and when you go to that frequency that we've tuned that station to, you hear it. And you know what, when I push the remote on the button, uh, of the button on the remote, uh, on my uh, cable but, uh, remote, and I want to go to say ESPN, and um, that system knows where ESPN has been programmed. If it goes to that frequency, it pulls ESPN out of this system, and you know basically spits it out on channel three to your TV. So that's kind of how it basically works. So the way they split this whole frequency band up, and again, this is the size of your, the pipeline. The low end is somewhere under, say, 54 megahertz in frequency or 55 megahertz. It's going to vary based on the, the cable company you're, you're dealing with. And then they start adding in video channels and other stuff up above that. And uh, this generally is referred to as the return path, and I'll get into that in a second. But back when uh, everything was analog in the old cable world, and I'm, getting, I'm talking analog, okay? And of course today a lot of the system is a mix of analog and digital. But back in the day when analog was king, we needed six megahertz of this window to get you one channel. So between say 54 and say 60, that's where channel number one would sit in the system. Okay? And then of course from 60 to 66. We got channel number two stuffed in there. And then of course every another six megahertz, we got number channel number three, and another, and another, and another. And depending on how far out in frequencies we were operating at, you know, 500 megahertz, say 700 or eight, or maybe 800, all the way up to 860. You know, in 860 megahertz, uh, you divide that frequency range by six, you come up with about 130 channels that you could stuff in that system. And again, um, that's back when everything was analog. So we've obviously gone past 100 channel, 100 some channels years ago. And uh, so how are we doing this? Well, we're digitizing signals. And essentially, it's interesting that we still use this 6 megahertz carrier wave. But within that carrier wave, we can digitize these signals. And depending on if it is a high def or not, and again, a high def channel has a lot of information within it. Uh, if it's a high def channel, we might only get a couple, maybe three channels in that six, six, uh, same 6 megahertz range. But if it's a standard definition channel, especially like one of those music channels or something like that, we can stuff 8, 10, maybe 12 channels or more in that same 6 megahertz. So this is how we're getting to all these you know, extra channels within the system itself. Okay? And it is, again, a mix of uh, analog and digital, and it has to be bidirectional. And, uh, uh, and one interesting thing about utilizing this, this frequency range, and as I said before, co coax has always been a very big pipe, but you know, 30 years ago we only used that much of it. But what part of the pipe, what part of this frequency would we use back in those days? Would it be the, the low end stuff? Uh, maybe a mid range in the five or 600 megahertz range? Or could it go higher than that, obviously? Uh, maybe, you know, 800 and then above. And, um, the answer to that question, uh, it was, we used the low end. And the reason we used the low end frequencies is because guess what travels further down a piece of coax? High frequencies or low frequencies? And the answer is actually low frequencies. And this all has to do with something called attenuation in the cabling, which is signal loss in the cabling. And we uh, measure that signal loss in a unit of measurement uh, called a dB. So it, uh, a D, whoops, with a capital B. Okay, dB. And the B is capitalized, and the reason it's capitalized is because it's named after somebody. And if you want to take a stab at who the decibel might have been named after, it would be uh, Nat, uh, Alexander Graham Bell. But, so we'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. But this, this attenuation is caused by two main things in a cabling. One is the length of your wire. And obviously the longer the wire, the more loss you have in a cabling. Now, the other main problem is frequency. The frequency of the signal makes a big deal about this. Higher frequencies don't travel 
as far down a cable as lower frequencies do. And I'll give you a great analogy, and that is sound traveling through air. And as you stop at the red light, and the guy behind you has the stereo just a blasting, what do you actually hear as far as sound inside your car? You actually hear and feel, by the way, the boom, 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 which is the bass uh, frequencies. And uh, it, it's just a natural thing. Low fre higher, low frequencies will travel further, and that is true in wire as well. So back in the day, the cable company never literally wanted to put any channels out here because they were weaker by the time they got to the outlet in the room and actually more susceptible to noise and, and interference problems. So, but today, you know what, we're stuffing this pipe like we never have and we're having to use these higher frequencies. Uh, and this is how come these splitters and connectors and everything else has got to get better and better uh, today because again, the pipe's getting bigger and bigger and bigger, okay? So this is kind of the frequency ranges that we deal with in, um, and, and uh, why we want those splitters to be one gigahertz. And if you want to look any of this up, you can. There's an organization out there called the Society of Cable Telecommunication Engineers. These guys write the standards for the cable TV systems and on how things ought to perform and operate within their systems. And you know they give them away for free. So if you want to go to their website sometime, you can actually download uh, the standard on a splitter. Now. The next thing that you got to deal with with cable TV splitters is there's a little bit of loss associated with those. And um, when you look at what a two-way splitter does, it does exactly what you think it might. And it's going to take an incoming signal. And I don't know, you know what the strength of that signal is. And it's going to deliver half of it over here and half of it over here. So the incoming signal, say, is 100% of something. Again, I don't know what it might actually be, but it's 100% of something. And so each of these two ports actually end up getting somewhere under that um, because there's some loss associated with the splitter itself, too. So um, it's somewhere under 50%. And as I mentioned before, we measure this thing in a, something we refer to as a decibel. And um, when I say zero dB, a lot of people think that that means you have no signal, and that's not true. That actually is a reference point in a system that we measure up and down from. And actually, if the FCC says that if we took a dB loss meter and measured the signal strength at an outlet in a room, we'd like it to be at least zero dB. Um, and maybe a little above that. So that's kind of our mark in, a home, in a, an outlet in a room. Now, above that, when we get a 3 dB gain in a system, it goes up 3 dB in signal. And you buy amplifiers and things like that will have, uh, again, so many dB of rating in it. And uh, that means you've doubled in power is what it means. If I dropped 3 dB in signal, that means I'm four times hotter. Oh, I take that back. I'm half. Not hotter. Half. I've got 50% of what came in the front door. 6 dBs means you're four times hotter. Okay? And a 6 dB drop would mean you have a fourth of it left, or you got 25% of, again, whatever came in the front door. 10 dBs, you're 10 times hotter than you were. And a drop of 10 dB means you have a tenth of it left, or you've lost 90% of, of whatever it is. And we basically add and subtract these dB numbers when we start figuring about signal loss inside of a building. So I would say at 50%, the, these, the, it is going to be a little over 50%, we can safely say, and you'll notice that on the ports on the splitters, they generally will have kind of a number there. It'll say 3 point something or 7 point something, depending on what it is, uh, what type of splitter it is. Um, and I'm going to say on a two-way splitter, I know it's over three. I should be under four according to the standards. So I will tell you it's got about a four dB drop. And that's the number you'll see on the ports. And they both will say four dB drop. Okay? Now, that's a basic two-way splitter. A three-way splitter is actually designed by taking two two-ways like this and hook them together like that. And so these two, this 50% here got split again. So when I look at the signal strength coming out of these two, they're both getting around 20 
to 25% of whatever came in here. And since they've gone through a second splitter, they've gone they, uh, another two-way, they've lost another 4 dB. So now the ports on the cable will say 7 point something. And again, I'm going to round it up to 8. And I'm going to say they both say 8 on it. So when I look at the outside of a three-way splitter, it will say 4, 8, and 8 on the three ports. So if you don't know which one to put it on, you would might think it's maybe that 8 is good, but actually it's not. Um, I would put the longest run in the house on the one that said 4. Now, a four-way is actually done by taking three two-ways and tying them together like this. And these two ports are also getting around 20 or 25 percent of whatever came in the front door because we took whatever that was and we chopped it into fourths, basically. And so again, these two ports over here will say 8 dB as well. Okay, so not all is losing around 8 dB of signal. Okay. And that's how we go about figuring how much signal you're losing. So if you need a two-way, don't buy a four-way. And obviously, if you need a four-way, don't buy something bigger. And you can buy eight-way and 16-way splitters out in the market. But keep in mind, you might have to amplify that signal pretty good. And uh, how much, I don't know. Uh, it, it all depends on, on the splitter you're, you're dealing with. And obviously, you know, bigger splitters lose more signal. And, um, Beside, and, and, uh, but I can always make a bigger splitter if I have to with, with the equipment I, I see in the stores. And that is by cascading splitters together, we can basically make bigger splitters just like they did, only when they got done it was inside of a pretty small package. But I could, if I wanted, go out and buy a four-way splitter, or two-way I should say, two-way, and then feed, buy two fours. And now I got you know four here, and I can add another four eight-way splitter here, and basically create an eight-way splitter, and or twelve if I want to go three-way here and three fours. And if I look at the numbers of what we're losing signal strength-wise, I know a two-way splitter loses that four dB of signal. Okay, and I know these. Four ways, every one of them, though, though those ports say eight on them. So we're losing both, you know, we're losing that. So if I add them up, and I'm not going to count the cabling in between because it's, you know, foot long, although cable does lose signal, and I'll cover that in a second, we've got about 12 dB drop here in signal. All right, now again, if you went home and hooked up the, the TV like that, uh, would, would it work? And the answer is, I, you know, I don't know, you have to go home and try it. Uh, when we look at the signal strength on the side of the home, you could assume, if, if things are working right, probably around 10, possibly 15 dB, somewhere in that range. Say they were giving us 15 dB on the side of the home, and we have a setup like this. Now, we have 15 coming in, we're losing 12, so if I'm not counting the cabling in the walls as well, you're, you should have 3 dB left over falling out at, at, at the outlet in the room. should work. And again, zero to five is what I would say would be good for an outlet in the room, although it all depends on your TV. You might get away with a minus 10 dB signal. It all, again, go home and try it, okay? Um, and when we look at the loss in cabling to a good rule of thumb would tell you that RG6, depending on frequency, we would say a 100-foot length of RG6 loses someplace between four and 6 dBs every 100 feet. So a 50 footer would, might lose more like 2 dB and a 200 footer might lose more like 8 dB of signal. So that's how we go about again figuring signal loss and different cables and stuff and seeing if something works. But anyway, so uh, we can always make larger splitters if that's the case you're needing. Okay? Now, one other thing I'll leave you with on besides the loss is, is the fact that today we will sell what are called termination caps. And termination caps are these little metal caps that we put on the end of the uh, port of, on the splitter. It's not being used or an outlet in the room. Now, since we're being forced to use these higher frequency signals, and as I said, they're more susceptible to things at the outlet in the room, um, we, have, we, and we, we worry about making sure we, we can hang on to those signals. So from, say, a splitter, and, you know, the signal comes in the side of the home with cable TV. And we hit a you know a splitter here, and one of these ports on the splitter goes out and feeds an outlet in a room someplace. 
Now, we are telling you today, if you are not using that out in the room, that we would take one of these little metal termination caps, and they're very small, and terminate the outlet in the room with the termination cap. And then we would also ask you to go ahead and terminate all the unused ports on your splitter you may not be using. Now, the reason we're asking you to use termination caps today is that, again, we're more worried about these higher frequency channels. First of all, if I'm vacuuming, say, near this outlet in the room, all wires, by the way, are antennas, and uh, especially if they're not grounded properly. And uh, the EMI, the electromagnetic interference being generated by this vacuum, and again, that's a magnetic field, it crosses the wire here and it can deduce noise and interference problems we like to avoid. The other problem with this is this whole 5 to 1 gigahertz frequency range we've been talking about. You know, over-the-air broadcast companies use the same thing, and you know what, or in that range someplace, I should say, and also the AM and FM band is in that range too. So if you're living right down the street from the radio station, or maybe a TV station, both those again are broadcasting tons of RF into an air, you can pick up stray signals out of the air. So we refer to that as what we refer to as multipathing. Now, the other huge problem we have here is the signal is traveling down a piece of coax. And the coax is referred to as 75 ohm wire. And that means the cabling, the connectors, the splitters, the, the set-top boxes, the DVD, the, the Blu-ray player, it's all built to be around 75 ohms of, of impedance. So as the signal hump, uh, goes down the wire, it sees kind of a level playing field. Well, uh, if the signal's traveling down a 75 ohm highway, it hits an open connection. You might guess an open is a big uh, resistance, and it's like a brick wall the signal sees. Now, if you remember your high school physics, the energy just doesn't disappear. It has to go someplace. And essentially, it's like me taking a tennis ball when I throw it at the wall over here, and when the energy in the ball hits the wall, does the ball simply slide to the floor, or where does the energy in the ball end up going? Well, of course, it reflects at you. And this causes a standing wave problem, okay? The standing wave is equal to and out of phase with this incoming signal going back the other direction. And it can cause ghosting and distortion problems within that system. And again, we want to eliminate this. So, if you look at a termination cap, it's actually a very simplistic thing. It's a, it's a little metal thing uh, that looks a little hex thing that we screw to the end of the outlet in the room. Or in the room. And it's got a little bump on one end of it. And uh, the inside of here is actually a small uh, 75 ohm resistor and it puts itself between the center conductor and the second conductor in the cabling which is that shield so it puts a 75 ohm load across the two conductors and that little uh, resistor absorbs the signals coming down this cable uh, and it dissipates it in the form of heat now and the reason this works is because if you ever look at the signals coming down this cable and if you're, I don't know if you ever actually touch the coax uh, that's plugged in the outlet and see if you can get shocked, you're, you're not going to because they work on millivolts of signal which is very small amounts of signal strength but at very very high frequencies again at you know one gigahertz in frequency if I say something's a you know like a 500 megahertz in frequency that means the signals are turning on and off at 500 million times a second so we want to eliminate these bumps and things so forth in the cabling. That's again why we tell you don't kink it, don't bend it. So this is what a termination cap does for us. So we've covered a lot of stuff in this last half hour on uh, the types of splitters you find out there and which ones you ought to be using and why we need to use those. So thanks again for sitting in on another segment of uh, terminating low voltage cables. I'm Ron with Ideal and we'll see you next time.